And this is Irene Woods. In this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about bands. I have knitted the button band side. And it is a double layer stockinette. I've turned it to the inside and I'm sewing it down. This is the seam I'm creating. And quite honestly, this is one of my favorite ones. It looks very nice on the inside, almost like a braid. It is so simple. It's just an overcast stitch. What I'm doing is catching the inside loop of the seam where this was picked up. This was picked up from the edge of the sweater, knitted this way, and then folded back over. I picked up a whole stitch on the edge, and so now we have two loops that are in the seam. I'm only using the inner loop. And I'm sewing it down stitch for stitch. In other words, every stitch on this side will be caught. Now it won't be here because when I picked it up, I picked up three stitches per four rows. Three stitches for every four rows when I picked it up off the edge of the sweater. So I will be skipping a stitch on this side, but I am trying to pick up every stitch on the cast off edge. I bound off using the stitch through stitch method that I used in the first part of this lesson. Okay, It's time to skip a stitch. I'm going to skip this and then begin here. Okay, I think you can see how that's developed. It really makes a nice corded or braided effect on this seam. So you would continue this all the way to the end, just like we started it somewhere else. When I get to the end of the band, this is a thing that puzzles a lot of people. It's very common to have the band be too short right here, and it will pull up and make kind of a funny, almost a curve. What I always do when I'm picking up the band is add one extra stitch past the beginning of the ribbing. And I also do the same at the neck. When I'm beginning this, I will e-wrap cast on one extra stitch after I have picked up all of these. So or here I would have picked up to the end of the ribbing and then made an e-wrap cast on. That gives me one stitch past the edge. Now I'm going to close up this short seam at the end of the band. I'm going to use a simple overcast stitch. Catch the very first stitch at the top. I'm going through half a stitch. And I'm skipping the knots or the tight stitches and I'm sewing through the loops 
You have to sort of keep pulling that out as you work because it really wants to curl inwards. When you get to the end, and then we've we've made a, a knot around that yarn is what I just did. Insert the needle into the band and keep it in the middle between the layers. Take your needle through. In fact, a lot of times I will sort of gather the band up onto the needle and then pull the needle out. Okay, give that yarn a tug. That helps set that last stitch. Now, pull the yarn just a little bit. You can see a little bit of gather there. That's deliberate. And then cut the yarn close and then give that a pull. And it works the end back inside. And that's really all the finishing that needs. I would go ahead at this point. Well, actually, I would have finished the seam first. But I will need to go back now and do that. I want to show you the top side of this, however. I'm going to treat these ends. This is all that's left to work in off the yoke. I've already got everything down here. But I still have three ends that need to be worked in. This is just as simple as it can be. In this case, I probably need to take one stitch because this little loop, we talked about the Fair Isle in a couple of earlier videos. And if you'll remember, I said be sure that your yarns, both of them, go all the way to the end stitch because if they don't, you'll get a funny little loop, jag, whatever you want to call it. And in this case, I didn't. I missed that one. So that's why it's doing what it's doing. Don't take your needle under this way. That's the temptation, but then you end up with a real loop. So leave it like this. I'm going to take one little stitch right here to help fasten this down. If you're working on a metal bed machine, you almost never will have this happen. Brother bulky machines have a setting under the carriage that will allow you to select those end stitches and it prevents this from happening. On a studio machine, Singer, Studio, uh, Silver Reed, you would need to bring the end needles forward every row. And that will also then take care of knitting that end stitch. I was on an LK150, and that's what this pattern is actually drafted for. LK150 and Brother KX350 do not have any automatic way to take care of that end needle. And if you just simply begin knitting your fair isle back without bringing this loop out to the end, then you can get a loop. Now, this was only one needle. If that was a, a span of three or four needles, can you imagine what we would have? Anyway, back to this situation. <clears throat> I have taken one stitch here on the edge, and let's just get another one, just to make sure. And that's just a simple little running stitch. Now, put your needle in, just like we did at the end of the band, run it between the layers, and out. That's all there is to it. These other two remaining strands of yarn don't need that stitch because the contrast came all the way to the edge. So just simply pass the needle between the layers, go through about two inches, and out. Do that again. <clears throat> 
pass the yarn to the inside of the band. Be sure it stays between the layers. Take it about two inches through and pull it out. That's absolutely all there is to it. Pull up just a little bit on the yarn, just a little bit, and clip it. That pops the end back inside. This is the easiest part of working ends in on this entire sweater. Now, what do we do at the neck band? Because we have an open band here, but our yarn tail is clear down here. We're just simply going to work it back and forth until we get to the top. Back and forth through the seam. Keep your stitches short, every stitch or so. And all I'm doing is going back and forth through the seam line. We've reached the top. It's easier for me to sew from right to left, so I'm going to flip this over and do exactly what I did on the bottom. Overcast stitch, going through the loose stitches, skipping the tight ones. I need to get back on camera. And you will need to keep rolling this back out because it wants to curl to the inside. When you get to the end, take one little tack stitch. I'm pulling the yarn towards me, coming back around up from underneath through that loop and tighten. Then take your needle back down between the layers just like we've been doing. Give that a little tug to pull the knot to the inside and clip it. This isn't truly a mistake, but it just looks strange. The fabric pulled, which is not terribly uncommon. So what I'm doing is working in some fake stitches to fill that gap up. This actually was hung on the machine right, but this fabric was just a little bit loose in this top tier, this three row tier here. And when I hung it back on the machine, it stretched out. So you're seeing this kind of odd. Well, I should go down one row below where I started. Let's go back down here. Now bear in mind, this is not a seam. I'm not joining anything together. All I'm doing is adding some chains on top of the fabric to fill in this gap. See how much better that looks already? 
wish the tail was just a little bit longer than it is, but we can manage. So I am going to take a little tacking stitch right here. Because I don't want this end to come loose. And then pass it to the inside of the band just like we've been doing. And out. Give the band a tug, the end pulls back inside. Now you may want to use your needle and finesse this a little bit. That loop's a little small, but it sure looks better than it did. This is going to have to be blocked, and at that point I will need to coax these stitches back into better line. There we have it. I have knitted the first half of the outside of the band on the buttonhole side. And I have already marked the buttonholes. So now I'm ready to make them. And I will be using the same instructions that we did in part one of this series. So I'm not going to go over that again in great detail. But I do want to point out a few other things that you should be thinking about when you put this band back on the machine. It isn't so noticeable with a sweater that's all one color, but when we get into um, patterning of any kind, and particularly with the round yokes, it's really important that each section on this front band is the same number of stitches as the corresponding area on the button side. On this pattern I hung six stitches in this little area here that is the neckband. I picked up and hung 34 stitches in the yoke. I picked up 71 stitches in the plain body section and then another 12 in the bottom ribbing. I also added one extra stitch, E-wrap cast on one extra stitch on the outside edge on the top and on the bottom. That allows this to be sewn together, this edge here to be sewn together, and it prevents that little bow that we frequently see on the top and bottom edges of a button band or a buttonhole band. We're now ready to begin doing the buttonholes. I have just marked all of the buttonhole stitches. I'm going to knit five rows. Now after I did the sample, I just really was not happy with the width of the band in relation to the size of the buttons. So instead of using 12 rows on each side of the band, I have changed that, cut it back to 10 rows on each side of the band. So what I've done now is knit five rows from the pickup to the mark stitches. I'm going to knit five rows at tension six, one row at tension eight, and then another five rows at tension six. I'm now going to begin making the buttonholes. I'm using the same instructions that we had in part one, and I'm making a two-stitch buttonhole. After trying the button on several times, 
after, uh, when I was making the sample. I just feel more comfortable myself going with the smaller buttonhole. I know it's going to stretch. And the button goes through quite well right now. And after it's buttoned a few times, it's going to go through without any problem whatever. Of course, you can use whatever you feel works best for the buttons you have. And the only way to know that is to actually make some samples. Now, I had... Um, I have 13 stitches between these first buttonholes. So, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 13, and then pull two forward. You've seen me do this so many times in part one of this lesson. I'm not going to do any more on camera. If you need a better visual, then I recommend that you go back and watch part one over again. Okay, we have two buttonholes completed. I'm going to do the rest off camera and then I'll be back. I just finished completing all of the buttonholes and now I'm going to knit five more rows. Turn the tension dial up as far as it will go. In this case that's tension nine and I'm going to knit one row. Now I'm going to cast off using the stitch through stitch method. And when I get that done, I'll be back. I have bound off the entire band, removed it from the machine. These are the buttonholes. It's now time to pull out the crochet cotton, bedspread cotton. I find it's a lot easier to remove the marking thread when I use these short pieces. You can use one long piece of ravel cord, and some people actually prefer that instead of a bunch of small pieces. But for me, it's just easier to handle if I have it cut in short pieces. Okay, and here are our buttonholes. And remember this yarn has some wool in it, which means it sticks together a little bit. And you may have to go in and see here's how one of the buttonholes has sort of closed itself up. Let's see if we turn it a little bit. And you have to pull just a little bit to get it apart. It isn't really stuck together, but the, the fibers in the wool catch on themselves. And that is just a characteristic of the yarn. It just does that. You can see these little fibers in here? I think you can. And that's just a characteristic of wool. But every buttonhole appears to have formed correctly. And I always do check it on both top and bottom. And it's a good idea to do that before you go on because if you didn't get every stitch caught when you were binding off those, particularly this side. It can happen if you're not careful. You can um, have one of the stitches not behind the latch when you're trying to knit the transferred stitch through. 
and if you didn't have both of them behind the latch sometimes you will have a dropped stitch or a misformed stitch but everything looks good so I'm going to go and sew it up just like we did the button band and then I'll be back I have now laid the completed cardigan out to be steamed steamed very lightly um, if you want to do this I recommend keeping the iron at least an inch above the fabric don't use the highest heat setting I have mine actually set on the lowest setting that it will still produce steam keep the iron moving don't hover it in one spot keep it moving the safest way to block, unless you really are confident about what you're doing, is to wet block it. And by that I mean lay it out, pat it into shape, and let it dry. That is the safest way to handle this. But I think it turned out pretty well. And I did change the number of rows. Originally when I did the first video in this series, I did 12 rows in the band and I just didn't think that was proportionate to the buttons so I've cut it back there are 10 rows on this side of the band 10 rows on the underside of the band and personally I like this better one other thing that I'd like to point out while it's flat on the table if you'll remember from the first part of the pattern I had you do some short rowing under the yoke in this area right in here and I had you do more on the front than in the back. This is why. You actually get some shape in the neck that way. And it is a lot more comfortable. This concludes the support videos for this sweater. The mid-gauge Fair Isle round yoke cardigan. I hope you've enjoyed it.